I'd like to talk to you about two persons that have really challenged my life. Two very different characters. One reminds me of some of my English friends, and the other one reminds me of some of my American friends. Their names are Caleb and Joshua. We can pick up the story in Numbers. Numbers chapter uh, 13 and also chapter 14. Moses had sent the spies into the uh, promised land, and they had come back. They'd come back with a report. And it's interesting to read that report and pick up the story and see how these two men, who later were considered great men of faith, to see how they responded to a crisis situation. A lot of disunity, a lot of complexity. Let's pick up the story in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 30. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. I think we need to go back actually a little before that. Let's look at verse 25. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses and Aaron and the community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed, showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent to us to explore, and indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produced. But the people living there are powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants. This is the descendants of Anak, the Amalekites, live in the Negev, the Hittites, the, Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, the Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, along with the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. This is what Caleb said. A little bit like the vocabulary of, of some of our American friends. Let's go at once and take the land. You know, Let's do it. Sounds like he's from Texas. I'm actually going there tomorrow. Let's go at once and take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread, their, they, they, they spread this bad report among the land, around the land, among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes there to live. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. Maybe you're the kind of person that likes to put a title on a message that you hear. You can call this one grasshopper mentality. God forbid. And yet, to me so often, God's people are filled with grasshopper mentality. So easily we see the problems. I think of today here in Britain, people are saying, oh, the Muslims are going to take over the country. Oh, somebody put a headline in the newspaper, the church is dying. It's grasshopper mentality. The problems may be great in Europe. Europe is the only continent where the church doesn't seem to be growing very much visibly. By the way, it still has to grow quite a lot just to keep up with the big stampede of Europeans that are going to heaven, and that's quite a few. The Bible says narrow is the way and few will be that find it. So I don't think we should develop some kind of European Christian inferiority complex simply because things seem so much better in Brazil or Korea or Kenya. God is on the move in Europe, and we are praying for greater things. Let's turn away from grasshopper mentality. But let's go on and pick up the story. We find there was one other person who also had the faith to overcome the difficulties. We'll get to him in a moment. Chapter 14. Then the whole community began weeping aloud. <laughs> That's pretty, uh, pretty challenging. I wonder how Moses really, uh, what he thought when he, he saw them all crying. They cried all night. The voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. I'd love to share, there's not time now, on as Christian leaders, how do we handle opposition? How do we handle criticism? How do we keep going when everything seems to be going wrong? The prophets of doom seem to be winning the day. 
So they were really crying out against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt. Whoa. Or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Imagine trying to lead a crowd like this. Maybe you're a Christian leader listening and watching this, and maybe you're having a bit of a hard time. I doubt it if it's more difficult than this. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord pleases or is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. That's what Joshua said. Joshua reminds me of many of my English friends who are more laid back, especially my friends from Cumbria, especially those that go to Keswick. This is definitely Keswick language. If the Lord is pleased with us, he'll bring us safely <laughs> into the land. Here's an amazing thing. God is not so concerned about our vocabulary. Of course, it has significance. Here's two different people, two different ways of expressing what was on their heart, and yet they both were chosen as men of faith, and the only two that eventually got into the promised land. We don't have time to follow the story as to when they crossed the river into the promised land. And of course, there were lots of conflicts. There were lots of battles. I want to ask you, will you be a Caleb? Will you be a Joshua? We're seeing a lot of giants across the world. We're seeing the giant of, of New Age religions and spiritism just all around us. We're seeing a huge giant of Islam. I think it's important when we talk about Muslims to realize that some of the greatest opposition to terrorism comes from moderate Muslims. And we need to be compassionate and loving toward all of our neighbors. Whether we like the smell of their food or not, we should demonstrate the reality of the Good Samaritan. We should demonstrate the reality of Jesus. So we're living in a day when it's not difficult to see the giants. We look at this giant of materialism. We see so much of the work of God is lacking finance. And yet we hear of people, sometimes even Christians, spending money as if they just have tons of it stored away in one of their back rooms. Materialism is a powerful force, and it's a giant that can be very frightening. We think of this giant that's facing us of a renewed atheism with people reading books about atheism and these books selling in very big numbers. It is, in some ways, a scary day to live. In some ways, there's no bigger giant than the lukewarmness we see among God's people. In the book of Revelation, it says, be hot or be cold. If you are lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Sometimes when I'm in a country, the people are going on and on about all the problems in their country. And they're blaming Hollywood or they're blaming Washington or they're blaming a particular president. It's a, a lot of the blame game is going on these days. But I think sometimes the greatest problems, as we look at this needy world, as we look at this lost world, I believe some of the greatest problems are in you and me. When we allow lukewarmness to come in, we allow wrong attitudes to come in. We allow judgmentalism and Phariseeism to come in. I read a book recently called Extreme Righteousness that shows that as Bible-believing Christians, very easily, without knowing it, we develop a Pharisee streak this book was actually a Bible study on the Pharisees and exposed some of the Pharisee streaks that I still had in my life despite an extreme commitment to grace and grace awakening. I so thank God for his mercy and his forgiveness, especially when I sin and when I fail, that he loves me and I can confess my sin and he's faithful and just to forgive me. 
I hope that in the days to come, I can be like Caleb. I can be like Joshua. Being an American, but living 46 years in Britain, I'm happy with either one of the vocabulary. But I want to go forward. I want to take on the giants. I want to possess the land and see the church planted among all peoples in all nations. Because I know that's on the heart of God. And I hope you'll turn from anything, anything that's hindering you and your walk with Jesus, any unbelief, any doubt, doubting Thomas-isms, and go forward as Caleb and Joshua. We can go up at once and take the land. If the Lord delight in us, he'll give us the land. God bless you as you go forward in the task that the Lord has given to you.